Okay, I'm going to call to order the uh, April 25 special meeting of the Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, first item on our agenda is roll call. Commissioner Teta. Here. Commissioner Kohler. Here. Commissioner Chernick. Here. Commissioner Goldberg. Here. Commissioner Flagg. Commissioner Tetzloff. Here. Councilmember Rodriguez. Here. All right. Uh, do we have any communications from Planning and Development Services Director Jenny Marsh? Good evening, Commissioners. So this evening, um, we do have one item on the agenda. The same will be true for May 16th. We will have our regular third Wednesday meeting, but and we only have one item on that agenda, and we won't have two meetings, just so you know that early and ahead of time. Okay. That's all I have. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, this is a public hearing. Uh, we have a public invited to be heard section right now. Uh, this is for anybody who would like to speak about something that is not on tonight's agenda. Um, there will be a uh, public hearing part of the agenda item. So if somebody would like to come forward and uh, give us your two cents, your five minutes worth of comments, uh, we'd love to hear from you. It's for anything that's not on tonight's agenda. Anybody? Okay, nobody's coming forward. We'll close the public invited to be heard. Um, we have minutes from March 21st, 2018 uh, to possibly approve. Um, any discussion, any motions to approve our minutes? Commissioner Teta. I motion to approve. Uh, motion to approve by Commissioner Teta, Commissioner Tesloff. Seconded by Commissioner Tesloff. Uh, all those who were attending the meeting, uh, any, those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Aye. Commissioner Kohler abstains. So, so, oh, and Commissioner Goldberg abstains as well. Um, so two abstentions, but I think that leaves one, two, three, four. Yes, we pass. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, so next on our agenda is uh, item six, the Land Development Code and Official Zoning Map Adoption, PZR 2018-4, with Principal Planner Brian Schumacher and Principal Planner Aaron Fosdick. Good evening, commissioners. Brian Schumacher, Planning Development Services. Appreciate your time this evening. Uh, again, uh, what we're here for this evening is for the Commission to make a recommendation to City Council with respect to the Land Development Code update as well as the official zoning map. So this is your 13th meeting we've had in the last 16th months to uh, talk about code stuff. So I'm wearing my Star Wars tie, so may the force be with you. To make <laughs> so anyway, I'm going to start off the presentation, kind of do the bulk of the kind of project overview, um, future amendments, land development code amendments overview, and then Aaron will assist in terms of uh, discussion with respect to the zoning map update overview. So as I mentioned, I'll just provide a little bit of background. You've heard this before a number of times, of kind of why we're doing this um, as part of the implementation of the Envision plan, um, as well as other city um, plans and documents. Um, as noted, the Envision plan was adopted in June 2016. Uh, the sustainability plan was adopted in November 2016. The downtown master plan was adopted April 2017. All of those, there's components of each of those that, um, sorry, I guess I'll talk louder and talk closer, so I apologize. <laughs> So each of those, and particularly the Envision Longmont Plan, um, are part of this um, update to the Land Development Code in terms of implementation of each of those plans. There are certain aspects of all of them, but in particular the Envision Plan um, is the main focus of the update to the Land Development Code to implement, implement particularly the Growth Framework Plan associated with the Envision Longmont Plan as well as other goals and policies. So the last major update that was done to the Land Development Code was in 2001, and I was here at that time. Um, obviously, over time, as need has arisen, we've done subsequent amendments to the Development Code. I think there's been approximately 12 to 14 um, substantive amendments that have been done since 2001. Uh, in 2016, we initiated this update. Um, in conjunction with the adoption of the Envision Longmont Plan. 
and we entered into a contract with our code consultant um, and our code consultant started a code assessment and we discussed that code assessment with the Planning Zoning Commission in January 2017. Um, and so this, I won't read through this obviously, but this gives you an, an overview of kind of the original code update scope uh, that was anticipated with this code update. Um, generally to say, obviously, in addition to implementing the envision plan, uh, other aspects of the code update were to improve our development standards, make the code more user-friendly, more predictable process, as well as standards as part of the update. Uh, obviously, update to uh, be consistent with current planning trends. Obviously, since the last time this was a major update was 2001. It's been a number of years. So we asked our code consultant to take a look at what current trends are, best practices, and incorporate those as part of this update as well. <clears throat> as part of the update, we've also done uh, quite a bit of, as, as identified in your communication as well, um, done an, number of outreach presentations to a number of different organizations in the community. Uh, we've uh, given information out to the Neighborhood Group Leaders Association, Homeowners Associations. We've gotten information out on social media, a uh, couple of city line articles, um, a number of times call articles regarding the code update. Uh, we've been updating information on a regular basis on our city website with respect to the code update. and then. Um, a couple of weeks ago, on April 11th, uh, we had a couple of community meetings down at the uh, museum to provide an overview of the consolidated draft that was released in early April. So um, this won't be the last time you'll see some uh, amendments in the near future. I just wanted to touch upon a few of those that are, were outside of the scope of this code update, but that are important uh, components of different um, areas associated with the land development code that uh, will require some additional amendments in the near future. So just to kind of walk through those quickly, you've received some input from community members regarding this particular topic, uh, protection of river streams, wetlands, riparian areas. And so with respect to the uh, pending update to our open space, uh, master plan as well as our wildlife management plan and ongoing work with the Re Resilient St. Vrain project. Uh, we're going to be looking at that particular section as a separate amendment as well as our species and habitat protection section as well. And I know Don's uh, been working on some amendments with respect to uh, prairie dogs as well. We've had some discussions with community members as well as city council on that particular topic. Um, starting this year um, and either ending this year or uh, in 2019 is an update to the kind of the city realm standards with respect to the public improvement standards, which will likely have some impact and need for uh, additional amendments to the land development code, um, particularly when we're looking at uh, areas with, with regard to uh, landscaping standards. Um, I as part of the update with the public improvement standards, we intend to look at um, some additional standards with respect to xeriscape design as well as low impact design um, in conjunction with the landscaping. But there also be streets and utility design standards that may impact the land development code as well. And then ongoing discussions with respect to affordable and inclusionary housing. Um, councils have been having some policy discussions with respect to this topic. Uh, we did have carried forward the uh, affordable housing uh, incentives, zoning incentives that were adopted in uh, April of 2017 by city council um, in the draft, but there may be some additional uh, standards uh, incentives incorporated as part of that discussion with city council as well. <clears throat> and then uh, starting this year, um, and probably being adopted towards the end of this year, uh, will be the uh, building and fire codes conversion from the 2015 to the 2018 uh, international codes, which may have an impact potentially <clears throat> on uh, some certain aspects of the land development code uh, that we may need to bring back for consideration. Um, I think 
a few months ago, uh, this was incorporated as uh, part of the, the historic preservation chapter, which was going to be 1511. Um, and we had some discussions with the commission uh, a couple months ago about that. Um, we had hoped to incorporate that as part of this update process, but realized from a scheduling standpoint, it just didn't quite work out. So we're anticipating continuing that discussion um, after we have the land development code update and completing that process. Um, as noted in the communication, we have some ongoing work with respect to wireless telecommunications. Uh, we have some outside counsel as well as our attorney staff and Longmont Power Communications working on some potential amendments uh, that may affect the land development code as well. And then finally, uh, uh, with respect to our quality life benchmarks, adequate public facility standards, we anticipate having some policy discussions with City Council regarding things such as our transportation benchmark as well as our emer fire and emergency response time benchmarks as well that may dictate some additional amendments as well. So that's just kind of a brief overview of some future amendments to look forward to uh, that the Commission may be seeing um, uh, this year and or next year. Uh, so beyond that, here is the lineup of chapters in the Land Development Code. Actually, the the Names of the chapters haven't changed with respect to our existing land development code, so that's everything that's part of this particular update. Uh, these are kind of the major update areas um, as part of this update that were kind of the primary focus areas with respect to uh, zoning and uses, development standards, as well as administration and procedures. Some of those areas uh, have changed more substantially than others, and that kind of depends on how recent um, other areas um, have been modified. So, for example, the development procedures, that came before the commission a few years ago, and there was some reorganization, um, redrafting of that. So we didn't change a lot with respect to the development procedures, but there were still some changes in reorganization with respect to that chapter. Um, so I'm just going to touch uh, on a few areas. Zoning districts is the first. And like I said, I'm not going to read through everything on these slides. Uh, we did discuss with the commission last month uh, some of the zoning district changes uh, with respect to the zoning map update at your March meeting. Um, and then obviously it's noted on this, um, part of this process we're looking at options or opportunities for reducing and consolidating zoning districts. So we're, we're going proposing to go from 29 existing zoning districts to 17 zoning districts with this update. Um, then with respect to dimensional standards, lot and building standards, um, these are aligned with the envisioned density ranges um, as noted in the envisioned Longmont plan for the residential land use categories. So for example, the residential rural is uh, zero to one units per acre, residential single family is one to eight, uh, residential mixed neighborhood is six to 18, and residential multifamily is 18 to 34 with respect to dwelling units per acre. And then again, there is no proposed density cap or limit with respect to the mixed use districts. That'll be based on building height allowance and building placement. Um, in terms of uh, building heights, uh, there are some exceptions for additional building heights in the Residential multifamily as well as the mixed use districts and those are identified in the in the draft uh, particularly related to affordable housing uh, areas near transit facilities as well as major centers and corridors that would be your primary arterials as well as kind of the major intersections of arterials so and then we've also simplified some of the dimensional standards as well. Um, and as part of this, uh, there's also carrying, as I mentioned before, carrying forward the affordable housing incentives where there are lot size reductions for affordable housing as well as alley loaded uh, type of designs, which is an additional incentive that we talked with the commission about uh, several months ago. So this is just one example of a graphic that's in the uh, chapter 1502 three with respect to the zoning districts uh, try to incorporate some additional graphics as part of this update as well as trying to simplify the tables or have the tables be more specific to the individual zoning districts as well. Then I'm going to jump ahead to the use regulations which is chapter 1504. Um, so as part of this update is to 
simplify the tables as well as updating them in terms of organization. Um, right now, if, if you've seen the existing uh, use table in the land development code, there's a lot of extra language and standards actually right in the table. And so we've tried to simplify that and clean that up and separate those out additional standards into the use specific standards section of the of the use regulations chapter. So uh, as noted, uh, right now in the existing code, we have permitted, limited, and conditional use reviews in addition to accessory uses. Uh, for the most part, except for oil and gas facilities, we've eliminated the limited use review. Now we have the permitted and conditional and accessory, but we've also kind of incorporated this secondary uses, which kind of align, which was which aligns with the secondary uses outlined in the Advision Longmont plan. Um, so this is just a quick example of the revised table, which you've seen in the draft. Um, it's a lot cleaner than what our current version is. Hopefully the organization is easier. I, I Personally, I know it's a lot easier for me to find specific uses and categories that I'm looking for in terms of the table. Um, and then in addition to the table itself, there are use specific standards. Um, and these can vary depending upon the location and district or the type of use within a particular category of how those apply. Uh, examples might include specific distance separation or additional review when a particular use is near a residential area or district. And then uh, we have, as I mentioned before, we have the secondary uses incorporated into the use table. Um, and these are, again, consistent with the secondary uses that are outlined in the Envision Longmont Plan. Um, what we've done with respect to, and we had some discussion with Planning Commission about secondary uses uh, at several meetings. Um, I think last fall, we discussed whether or not we should uh, have a limit, particularly for example, uh, multifamily as a secondary use in a mixed use employment district, whether or not we should have a limitation in terms of percentage or do tracking of secondary uses either on a percent basis or a square footage basis. And we decided not to go that route just from an administration standpoint that uh, we felt that it's more appropriate um, to look at the secondary uses in terms of review, additional review criteria and or locational standards. So for example, uh, with respect to some smaller scale commercial uses, perhaps in the residential mixed neighborhood or the residential multifamily neighborhoods, there are some locational criteria as noted as well as uh, most of the secondary uses in the those residential districts would go through a conditional use review, which would require a neighborhood meeting as well as public hearing before the Plan and Zoning Commission. So, and then in terms of development standards, uh, this is predominantly in Chapter 1505, but there's also development standards in our subdivision regulations in Chapter 1507, as well as our science standards in Chapter 1506. Um, so I'm not going to touch upon all of those, but I'm certainly happy to respond to any questions that come up either from the commission or the public this evening. So as I mentioned before, uh, some areas involve more updates than others. Uh, some areas have been more recently updated. Um, parking standards were updated in 2014, I believe, and that's when we incorporated, um, in addition to parking maximums, um, the concept of not having parking minimums in certain areas such as non-residential areas. Um, let's see, uh, just a few other examples uh, in terms of uh, landscaping standards. Uh, that section was updated a few years ago, probably three or four years ago. But as part of this update, we've done some additional reorganization and, and uh, simplification in terms of, uh, we had some discussion with the commission about this as well, about eliminating the open space percentages, but then still keeping other required landscaped areas such as streetscapes, buffers, pocket parks, courtyards, and other landscape uh, requirements. 
So, so in terms of uh, building design, and I know we've talked about this, um, I think in January uh, with the commission about some of the building design standards. And as part of this update, actually since the consolidated draft came out um, in early April, uh, we've asked some of the local developers, consultants, and architects to take a look at the draft um, and see if they have any concerns uh, or suggestions. Uh, and we did receive a few suggestions that were rolled into the, uh, the draft for before the commission. But overall, uh, what we've heard is they like the flexibility, like the predictability in terms of the draft, uh, particularly for infill redevelopment projects. Um, and so, let's see. So one area where we've heard or received uh, probably a majority of public comments to date of areas that are not going to be future amendments. So, and this is related to a new section that's part of the land development code, and that's 1505-200, which is the residential compatibility standards. So this is a new section, and it supplements our existing use standards. Right now in the existing code, we have what's referred to as residential protection standards. And so uh, where those apply for certain types of uses, there is a distance separation requirement and or some operational standards as well, such as hours of operation. And so what we've tried to do, what we've done with this draft is in addition to those particular standards, um, and to some extent, we've, we've maintained the, uh, some of the separation requirements, but in other instances where it made more sense, we changed that from a necessarily a separation requirement to a more of a conditional use review when a certain use is within a certain distance of a residential district. But in, t in addition to those use standards that are in Chapter 1504, this new section kind of builds upon that in addition to other sections of the code such as building design and other areas that address compatibility with adjacent uses. Um, and as I mentioned, obviously, uh, there's probably a number of folks that want to speak on this this evening, this particular section. I think uh, in particular, most of the comments that we've received today have been regarding kind of the height transition between more intensive zoning districts and the adjacent residential areas as well. And I'll touch upon that in a little bit uh, well, shortly. So this kind of outlines, this slide kind of outlines some of the additional areas that are incorporated as part of this residential compatibility standards, a few others in terms of outdoor lighting and uses of operation. And then, Obviously, uh, as, as we've discussed before, and I think, uh, I think in January we had this discussion with Plan Zoning Commission about this particular topic. We've also followed up and had some conversations with City Council as well, um, I believe in, in March, early March. And then also uh, last week when we went to the Council just to kind of give a quick overview in terms of the um, code update that's out in the, the consolidated draft. There are some questions that was brought up regarding uh, this particular topic as well. So <clears throat> in terms of the uh, current code, um, we don't have a residential I mean, a building height transition standard in place except for what well, it's never been applied in terms of our current mixed use district. Um, but we're the goal is to, with respect to the residential compatibility standards, is to expand that so these standards would be apply anywhere where you have that interface between more intensive zoning districts and a less intensive residential district. <clears throat> so for example, uh, currently in the central business district in the downtown, um, there's a 45 foot height limit. Um, whereby we don't have that transition provision currently in place. And then the adjacent residential district um, next door would have their height limit, which is currently 30 feet, but it's measured to the midpoint as opposed to the peak. So with respect to this draft, obviously we've had conversations and you've heard from the neighbors um, 
we've heard from the downtown development authority we've heard from property owners as well and so there's obviously there's uh, difference of opinions and recommendations um, with respect to this particular standard um, and so what's currently in the draft is fairly similar to what we discussed with the commission in in January and then also with council in in March um, obviously what we've heard from the residential neighborhoods is that they would like to see something more restrictive uh, the downtown development authority board would like to see either nothing more restrictive than this or something less restrictive um, and so obviously we're looking to the Commission as well as City Council with respect to input uh, on this particular topic as well I will mention that we are planning to based on the discussion that we had with Council um, last week on the 17th that we're planning to have a follow-up discussion with Council next week on May 1st on this particular topic so we certainly welcome any input from the Commission this evening on this topic that we can forward on to the Council for their discussion next week as well so um, signs so 2015 uh, there was a Supreme Court ruling regarding um, content based sign regulations and so as part of this update one of the major focuses with the sign regulations was to remove those content based uh, standards and so we've gone through that and we're and to uh, remove that not only in the chapter 1506 but also the appendium to that which is the downtown sign design standards which the Commission adopted in 2014 or recommended adoption and council adopted that in 2014 as well and so that's why the downtown design standards are attached as part of the land development code as well because those will be part of that appendix so also with respect to the sign regulations the intent was to what well, we've heard from businesses as well as sign contractors and even our staff is that we want to consider allowing additional flexibility um, with respect to our sign standards as well as predictable in terms of process right now we have a master sign plan that allows for some flexibility but uh, we've heard that it can be um, costly to go through that process and, and somewhat time-consuming so with um, additional flexibility in terms of sign allowances and so for example right now on a single-use building there's a limitation of two wall signs so what we've done is increase that to um, any frontage that has street frontage or fronts onto a public public parking area for that business can have a wall sign we've also had allowances for additional wall signs for larger buildings um, so that if you have a certain facade frontage you can have additional wall signs to incorporate in those facades as well all right I'm moving this along so <laughs> So and then uh, finally, uh, in terms of administration of the uh, code, and so that would involve the general provisions, Chapter 1501, Development Procedures, 1502, our uh, non-conformity section, and 1508, Enforcement and Penalties, and 1509. Uh, those are kind of an, all incorporate some of the administration and procedures. Um, again, uh, as as noted before. Uh, the procedures were updated in in uh, a couple of years ago so we made some changes we've added some flow charts in terms of processes uh, a few other things of note um, as part of this update we are taking the submittal requirements uh, signature blocks which are currently in appendices and they're not really that user friendly and we're going to create an administrative manual that's kind of outside of the land development code and so we can create more user-friendly checklists uh, uh, for as part of our pre-application meetings for with applicants so it's a lot so hopefully it's a lot easier user-friendly for them to uh, know what's required as part of those submittal requirements and then as part of the administrative modifications uh, we've also incorporated uh, the standards with respect to modifications for infill and redevelopment projects uh, which allows for more flexibility with respect to those particular types of uh, projects because um, 
those can vary quite a bit um, depending upon the uh, scope and scale and context of the type of development. And so it allows more flexibility with respect to those. And then finally, in terms of the PUD procedure, uh, overarching goal on PUDs was to simplify the procedure for PUDs. Uh, so we're modifying our preliminary PD process to an overall development plan process with the goals of simplifying all the submittal requirements that are associated with an overall development plan. And, and so with, along with that would be to reduce the number of reviews that are required as part of that initial overall development plan as well as kind of the cost associated with that review as well. And then with the more flexible standards that we're incorporating as part of this code update, um, another goal is to reduce the need for uh, additional PUDs uh, in the future. Um, and so the intent would be that for future PUDs to be reserved for truly exceptional designs as opposed to just asking for slight modifications to particular standards for a PUD. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Aaron now to give you a brief overview in terms of the zoning map update. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Commission. Aaron Fostick with Planning and Development Services. Um, we've talked about the zoning map on several occasions, so this will sort of be a little bit of a review for you. Um, I think we first presented this in November, but have talked about it on at least um, I think two other occasions. So as we worked on the um, text updates and the updates to the code that Brian's been covering, we were also working on updates to the zoning map. Um, one of the main, main reasons, as Brian mentioned, for the whole purpose of the code update is to implement Envision Longmont. One major component of Envision Longmont is the future land use and transportation system and the growth framework. So this is um, the land use map from Envision, and really this forms the basis for the proposed zoning districts that we'll be reviewing with you tonight. As you know, and as we indicated in the communication, uh, the land use categories changed substantially with the adoption of Envision Longmont in 2016, and so consequently the lineup of zoning districts is proposing to be changed quite substantially as well. Um, this is a familiar map to you. This is our existing zoning map. Uh, as you can see, um, not super clearly because there's a lot going on in this map, but we have 29 districts currently. That includes eight residential districts, three commercial districts, four industrial districts, um, a single mixed use district, four separate planned unit development districts, as well as a public and an agricultural district. And we also have seven overlay districts. Um, not all of those are necessarily on this map, but we do have seven overlays. Um, and this is the proposed zoning map. It doesn't look super different, um, but there are a number of differences. So for comparison purposes, um, this draft lineup of zoning districts contains five residential districts, five mixed use districts, an industrial employment zoning district, one overall single PUD zoning district, and we've retained the public and the agricultural district, and we also have retained three of the overlay districts, the conservation overlay, the Terry Lake overlay, and the airport influence zone. Um, as Brian mentioned, there, there were a number of things that we needed to do to make the map consistent with, with Envision and consistent with the lineup of zoning districts that, that he referenced. And so we've taken a shot at looking at kind of why properties are changing their zoning. And you've seen this map before. But just to, to recap and for um, some of the people who, who may not be super familiar with this, we kind of categorized the reasons for the change into a couple categories. Um, the easiest thing to get rid of is kind of the gray. That's where there's no change. And that's really the public and ag districts. Um, those, aren't, those aren't changing even in name. Um, the next category that you'll see are the consolidation. Um, those are, are not, there's not a ton of those, but those are really the residential areas. You, you might recall that I mentioned we currently have eight districts. We're going down to five, and so there's some collapsing going on. Currently, we have an estate residential one, estate residential two, as well as a single family R1 zone. Those are all being proposed to be collapsed into our single family neighborhood zone. Um, so that's that dark, dark um, violet color. 
Next you'll see um, the kind of magenta color. Those are really areas where while the technically the zoning district has changed, it's really more of a rename. And so um, the residential single family zone that I just mentioned is essentially similar to the R1 residential low density, but the name is changing. And so you can see there's a substantial number of properties where the, the name of the zoning district is changing. Um, the gold color are PUD conversions. As Brian mentioned, we not only wanted to simplify the process for PUDs, but we also wanted to simplify um, how these are, how our current PUDs are looked at. And what we found was there's a number of districts, um, as Brian mentioned, that were PUDs because there was a, a minor exception to some standards, and that was the, um, the process that we used at the time. We've been able to convert most of these to base zoning districts. I would like to note that there's a few um, existing PUDs, um, one notable one that, that you probably all know of is Prospect, where the, the PUD is rather unique and there are a set of regulations that, that really govern that PUD and we felt like those needed to stay in place. And so there are a number of PUDs that are staying. Those will be rezoned to PUD or they'll stay PUD. Um, and then finally, the, the last category of change is Envision alignment. And so if you remember the Envision Longmont land use map um, and, and me mentioning that there is a, a pretty substantial change in the number of, in the lineup of districts, those are the areas in green here. Um, so we've gone from one mixed-use district to five mixed-use districts. A substantial reason for that is because Envision Longmont has um, called out mixed-use for centers and corridors, and so you'll see a lot of that here. There's other areas that are um, currently zoned, for example, general industrial that are going from, that are going to um, an industrial uh, primary employment category. So those types of things are all, all shown on this map. We've also, since the last time you've seen this, added um, some pretty substantial land areas. And you may or may not have noticed just because, again, there's a lot going on on these maps and it covers the whole city. But um, since we last presented this to you, we've added some annexations that were recently recorded. And so that's added some land area to the city. We've done a similar conversion process. Obviously, those were um, approved by city council under our current zoning and had exist the existing zoning applied to them. We've done a similar conversion process to convert those to the proposed zoning. You can see those here. There's a number of other annexations that, while they've been conditionally approved by city council, um, have not yet been recorded. And so those are not on the map yet. They will be on the map at some point and will um, need to, to do something similar. Some of those may be retained as, as PUD districts, but some of those will need to be converted as well. So in terms of the adoption, we're proposing that the map be adopted along with the, the land development code text that Brian has just covered. We're also proposing that this is um, a legislative rezoning, meaning that we're not asking individual property owners to come to the city and um, rezone each property. We're, the city will do that um, as one wholesale uh, legislative rezoning, and that would become effective um, at the same time as the code became effective, which obviously makes, makes sense. Um, so in terms of the next steps for this code update, Tonight, obviously, we're here seeking a recommendation from the commission on the um, draft code update as well as the proposed zoning map. Um, this is a public hearing item. Next, we will be taking that recommendation to city council. We currently have that scheduled for first reading on May 22nd. That would be followed by second reading and another public hearing on June 12th. Um, the code is currently written that it would become effective on July 1st. And there's a number of provisions in there that talk about projects that are currently in the process or entering into the process. And so um, that, that several week period will give us time to get, um, start getting forms changed and um, start, start getting everyone used to using the new code. Um, and so with that, we will turn it back over to the commission to conduct the public hearing. And also um, we can answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Brian. Um, so I've been thinking about how to run this meeting because we've got a lot to cover. Um, so uh, I uh, suggested to Brian ahead of time, and he thought this would work. Um, that at this point, we uh, ask him questions about our procedure, um, just limit it to that. And then we do the public hearing. And then we go chapter by chapter um, with uh, questions and comments and discussion. So that's how I'd like to do things. Um, I do have some procedural questions for you, Brian. Um, first off is um, in our discussion tonight, 
are we going to discuss the red line version, which was included in our packet? Yes. Okay. All right. So the, the first version, which we received at the start of April, that has been superseded by the red line version. That is correct. Okay, good. Um, secondly, uh, with the PZRs, which you included in our packet, there are, we usually have three. There's two in this. Um, the, uh, the one that we, that's not there that we usually have is one to uh, do a recommendation with, uh, with conditions. Um, so clarify for me exactly what, what, what are we potentially making a rec recommendation on? Does it include, uh, it's just the zoning map and the red line version? And what if we have um, things that we don't exactly agree with that's in this current version? Well, we thought, commissioners, we thought we could just incorporate that as part of uh, PZR A. Okay. Um, so if you do or don't have suggested recommendations, we can certainly incorporate those as part of uh, the resolution A as part of recommending approval to city council. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Any other procedural questions for Brian and Aaron at this time? Okay. This is a public hearing item, and we have people signed up to, uh, to speak about this. So um, I'll uh, call your name. Um, you'll come to the podium. You'll get uh, a green light for four minutes, a yellow light for one minute, and I'll cut you off at five minutes, but I'll be nice about it. Um, so let's get started. Uh, as you come up, uh, please give your name and address for the record, and let's start with uh, Rosemary Alley. Good evening. My name is Rosemary Alley. Uh, my address is 231 East 4th Avenue, Longmont. I don't know if you need the zip or not, okay? Um, my husband and I recently moved to Longmont. And uh, we moved here for several reasons. I mean, it's just an absolutely magnificent setting with views of Long's Peak, Meeker. Um, we're far enough out on the prairie that we can see the high Rockies. It's a glorious setting. But the main reason we moved to Longmont is because this is a city that's very people-oriented. This is a city about people. Um, all the beautiful parks in this town and miles and miles of walking and bicycle paths, the river walk down along the St. Vrain. But I don't think anything demonstrates how much this is a people city than Longmont's Old Town Historic District. Uh, this is a, it's, it's a real treasure here. Um, and it's, a, it's, a, it, it's amazing that it's still intact. That you still have these beautiful old historic neighborhoods that flow right into the downtown area and, and back the other way. And as so many places in this country where they have a historic area where they're allowing big t office buildings to come in that are too tall, and they cut into that district, they destroy it. And it's not just a historic connection here between the neighborhoods and the downtown, but it's an aesthetic connection. And it's not just the people living on the edge of, that are gonna be impacted, you know, having some big tall office building in their backyard, they're gonna be impacted. It's everybody in Longmont. We're all reaping the benefits tremendously from this rich, historic, beautiful, charming area. We can ride our bikes through, we can lock them up and wander through the stores downtown or go to, go to a restaurant and enjoy ourselves. We can, you know, except for it turns out during restaurant week, we can find parking pretty easily and, um, you know, uh, go get coffee or wander through the galleries or whatever. And uh, with, with office buildings coming in, it's going to cha change that dynamic tremendously. There's, there's going to be the overflow parking that's going to, uh, people are going to be moving into the public parking areas. And so residents who now just love to come downtown and enjoy what we have here, it's going to become more and more of a challenge to find parking. Over time, people are just not going to be as inclined to come down. So we're, we're all reaping tremendous benefits here. Um, I think Longmont is, is at a tipping point here. This is a very important decision, whether we protect this area or not. Um, and I think um, in today's world, um, what we have in Longmont's uh, Old Town Historic Neighborhood um, 
is, 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 like, uh, is equivalent to an endangered species. And we need to value it and protect it accordingly. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Alley. Um, next is Bill Alley. Good evening. Uh, my name is Bill Alley, and I have the address, same address, 231 East 4th Avenue. And I'll just add to, to Rosemary's uh, comments. One of the things that struck me about Longmont, in addition to the historic district, is actually all the neighborhoods that exist around uh, Longmont. And you, because of all the bike paths you have and everything, you get to see a lot of these. And you can see that they all have their own unique character, and people have been living there for a long time. So I. I think you have to think very carefully about any kind of impediment, about restriction of, of tall buildings going ev even in those areas as well as the historic district. And I agree with everything that that, that Rosemary said. Uh, you know, 45 feet doesn't seem like that much, but what I, I noticed there are eight of you. So each, if all of you stood on each other's shoulders, uh, you wouldn't quite make it unless you're taller than I think you are. Uh, you wouldn't quite make it to 45 feet. So it's really quite a, a high distance to have within, and 75 feet is not that far, it's not that far away too. So I would, I would encourage you to, to, in, to put in stricter requirements in terms of any kind of building height. From, it's from an aesthetic point of view, as Rosemary pointed out. It's actually from a nature point of view, and it's from a uh, privacy point of view for people who have been living here for a, for a very long time. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Alley. Uh, next is uh, Paula Fitzgerald. Good evening, uh, Commission. Thank you for your work on this. 13 meetings, wow. That's uh, a lot of work. I know you've considered things very carefully, um, and I appreciate all that work you've done. Um, I live at 419 Emory Street, and I'm here tonight to discuss mostly the residential compatibility chapter of the draft code. Um, I'm also here to represent the historic east side uh, zoning uh, subcommittee. We have, we will continue to be, and we are opposed to the minimal restricted zone and heights allowed in this chapter of the code. I've given you three copies uh, or th a document with, with three different attachments for your review. The first of which, with the one on it, is an updated copy of a survey of building heights. Um, you may have remembered this. I, I gave you a similar one last summer. On page two, we've now included the average building height on Main Street, which was surveyed between 3rd and 6th Avenue. So the average of those buildings there is 25 feet 6 inches. Of the 78 buildings found in this three block area, 90% of them are 35 feet or shorter. Page three shows the heights of the commercial buildings on the, on the east side of Kimbark Street. Again, all of which are below 35 feet except for the tower on the Central Presbyterian historic portion of that church. The homes surveyed on the uh, west side of Emory Street are all less than 35 feet and 70% of them are 25 feet or shorter. The new High Plains Bank addition is a compatible height and it's less than 35 feet high. The second document is a sketch of a potential project at 420 Kimbark Street. This shows the 75 foot restricted zone adjacent to the residential properties. As you can see, there's no building planned within this restricted area. Parking and landscape strips are also required in the code. And what's shown here is likely a typical, typical of future proposals. What this has created is a transition area that does not affect building height in the least. This is not compatible. We believe the entire lot should be restricted to a 35-foot building height, which again is at least 10 feet higher than most homes in other commercial buildings on Kimbark Street. 75 feet is just too little of a restricted area. The last document identified as number three shows the height and massing difference between the residential single family and the mixed use downtown zones. This shows a 45 foot building next to the maximum 35 foot high homes. Height and mass must both be considered. 
Most homes have gabled roofs, while commercial buildings typically have a flat roof with straight up walls up to the full height of the, the roof. Building mass at 45 foot high is not compatible with the neighborhood. One of the goals of development codes is to provide a harmonious patterns of development and not impede the quality of life for its citizens. Shadows from a 45 foot high structure will be cast over entire backyards, affecting gardens and outdoor enjoyment. This is not compatible. Main Street should be home to the tallest and most massive buildings in the mixed use downtown zone. To allow those same heights into the transition areas detracts from the downtown area in scale, mass, and intensity of use. There are many Main Street buildings that can be vertically expanded to provide additional square footage and support a distinct and vibrant downtown. Commercial buildings on the east side of Kimbark are all 35 feet or shorter. This has been compatible for years, and if adopted with the new code, will continue to be harmonious in the future. There are several people here who share this perspective tonight, and I would like to ask them to stand up and just show their, their support for these comments. Thank you. Um, finally, in my last minute, parking is also a topic that we've been told will, will require future work, so please keep that in mind that a lack of adequate parking in the downtown area will not only impact the merchants whose, whose customers have a hard time finding space, but it will also overflow into those adjacent neighborhoods. This is an ongoing par problem that must be addressed. And finally, to, with, that we support the conservation overlay zone in the historic east side neighborhood to protect our important and unique historic resources. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mrs. Fitzgerald. Next is uh, Katie Diver, please. Hi. My name is Katie Diver, and I live at 1246th Avenue between Lincoln and Grant on the west side. Um, I'm here tonight because I'm very involved with the art community in Longmont, and um, I'm speaking aesthetically, looking at downtown Longmont. So much work has been putting, put into beautifying it and making it a place where people want to walk and go to shops, go to galleries a lot of the public art that's put in. And I think it's really important, as everybody before me has said much more clearly than I can, that having um, a buffer zone between the residential areas and the downtown area seems like a very important thing and something to be taken very seriously, not to change that. Uh, we're lucky on the west side that Kimbard, at least so far, is staying at a lower level, but it looks like on the east side, if the zoning is changed, it will be a lot higher, and that will impact a lot of people who've lived there a long time. And I think we have to think about property values and the quality of life of the people in those houses. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Diver. Uh, next, Daria Laverne. Good evening, Planning and Zoning commissions, Commissioner and Commissioners. Um, my name is Daria Laverne. I'm Paula Fitzgerald neighbor. I live at 429 Emory Street. And I agree with everything that Paula said about um, what's compatible. Um, there's a church down the street from us that has a school. There's constant traffic. Uh, the speed on it is getting increasingly high. Um, and uh, when we have parades and when we have other things like that, traffic, instead of being diverted onto Kimbark, which is actually designed to handle the bus loads, are being uh, diverted onto Emory Street. So that's something that if there's more higher buildings um, and there's no transition zone and compatibility, we are going to be affected. And we're a residential neighborhood. We have young children there and people that just want to you know, walk around in the neighborhood, and not have to deal with a lot of heavy traffic. Um, and um, I noticed there's the use of the word revised and updated improvements type of thing, but none of that has ever been run by people in our neighborhood that I know of. And so when you do those revisions, updates, and improvements, I would sincerely hope that you would consider 
um, the neighbors that live there, the residents that, you know, want to have a nice, quiet Sunday without having a lot of um, impact from commercial use and people um, consuming products in the downtown area, even though we need to develop it and we want to have a really good uh, active and a lively downtown area. If there's no parking for it between uh, Kimbark and Main Street, then it ends up being overflow and parking on our street and there's just not that much room for it. And you suggested earlier diagonal parking. That's very dangerous for kids to run between diagonal parking, and I'm glad that was looked at again. So um, please consider having a compatible transition zone with height requirements that fit our beautiful historic downtown neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Laverne. Next, um, N. Canada. N. Canada. Mr. or Ms. Canada? No. Uh, Martin Orner. No, Martin Orner. Orner. Okay, anybody else who uh, didn't get a chance to speak who'd like to come forward and, and yes, sir, come on down. Commissioners and city council person and city staff, my name is Mike Palmer. I live at 360 Fifth Avenue and have for the last 41 years. Uh, on Emory Street, I have a view of Long's Peak. Not all year round because when the trees fill out in the springtime and the summer, it blocks my view of Long's Peak. However, when, the, when it's winter time, uh, I certainly do have a view from my front yard and certainly from my second story windows that face, have windows to the west and the balconies that have uh, views to the west. I think that it is important when someone such as myself who has only lived in my house for 41 years, the house is 132 years old, the house, the people that have lived there have had a mountain view of Long's Peak and Meeker for the last 132 years and I think with your proposed um, update in the zoning code, you are allowing the extinguishment of the Mountain View uh, vistas that people have enjoyed from my property for the last 132 years. I think you affect the property values and you certainly affect the historic district when you take away those mountain views and you create shading uh, by the, the creation of much taller buildings adjacent to residential properties along Emory Street. So I would please ask you to reconsider your um, views that would allow the extinguishment of my mountain views. Also, uh, the parking invasion of the downtown area, especially from uh, the Comcast cable people and their trucks, we are essentially allowing, uh, even though the city council long ago when, when the uh, cable TV company came in, said that they were not allowed to park their vehicles, their commercial vehicles and their employee vehicles in the neighborhood, that has been going on for the last several years, more than a decade. And it really needs to stop. The invasion of the commercial parking from downtown coming into the residential neighborhoods is a really bad thing that has happened and it needs to be fixed. And I think you could fix it in this zoning code. And I believe probably uh, protection for the historic districts with the overlay zoning could address these kinds of issues, although there's maybe another way to do it. Anyway, I thank all of you for all of your hard work on this. This is a big, big, big challenge to update the zoning code, and I appreciate all of your efforts, but I would like to maintain my mountain views. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Palmer. Anybody else would like to come forward? Anybody? Okay. Seeing nobody else, uh, we will close the public hearing and we will go to discussion, question and answer with the commission. Um, 
So like I said, let's, uh, let's start chapter by chapter and whack our way through. So first up is uh, chapter 1501, General Provisions. I know I have one item, but um, any commissioners first? Okay, I'll jump in with mine. Um, also, to make it easy on Jane, um, I promised her that we would uh, say exactly which section of the code we are talking about so that uh, when she does our, our minutes, she knows uh, exactly uh, what we're, we're doing. Um, okay, I am looking at, um, now this is gonna get a little squirrely with page numbers because um, we've got the pages in the document versus the pages uh, in the actual PDF that was was uh, uploaded, and that's because we have Roman numerals on the uh, on the table of contents. So, looking at page 17 of the uh, PDF, which is uh, labeled page four in the document, it's 1501.060, the official zoning map. Um, this would be a question for Aaron, actually. Um, so uh, I did not see in this section any explanation of how the airport influence zone is defined. Um, maybe it's elsewhere in our, in our code? Oh. oh, you can't hear me? If the commissioners could all really make sure that you're leaning into the microphone because okay. it gets hard to hear. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Chair Schernick, the airport influence zone is shown as a line on the map. That's what's, so this, this hasn't changed from the existing to the proposed. If you look at this map, you'll see a black line that kind of covers the western third of the city. And that was um, created and defined by an FAA study that the airport manager provided to us um, that, I won't go into the specific um, aviation technology okay. that they used, but it really looks at the um, where the runway is located, the flight path, and then um, that's where that, uh, this is kind of the whole impacted area okay. that's mapped on this map and that's shown in that black line. So if something came down to brass tacks and it, and it was like mathematically show me where that line begins and ends, uh, the uh, airport manager would have that definition. Yeah, we have um, a, a study that shows that there's contours and it looks like Brian wants to add something here. No. Well, but yes, we do have yes. a map. There's a uh, FAR Part 77 airspace plan that's adopted as part of the FAA um, that basically the outline of that oval that's on the zoning map is consistent with that airspace plan. Um, and so the airport influence overlay is also referenced, sorry, also referenced in, um, you know, Chapter 1503. It's uh, Section 1503.050 as part of the overlay districts. Right, but I, I, I was looking for a, for a very precise definition of, of how to calculate you know, where that line lands uh, on the map, and it sounds like, like the airport manager has that, so we're, so we're good. Okay, um, anything else on 15, chapter 1501? Commissioner Tesloff. Uh, just a clarification with this red line document. Um, that we are redlining the existing code and not a previous draft. And so if something's crossed out, that's what is currently in the code. Is that correct? Or is this the red line of a previous draft of the new code? So what we gave to the commission uh, was a red line of the consolidated draft that was put out in early April. Okay. Anything else? Let's move on to chapter 1502. Um, I'll kick it off. I've got something there too. A um, couple things. Let's see. Page 59 of the PDF, page 46 of the document. It's 1502.080. Um, administrative modifications, paragraph B. Um, 1.0. C, in instances of infill and redevelopment, the director may grant an administrative modifications beyond 25% of the numerical standards in the chapters referenced. So this caught my eye um, because 
Uh, I'm wondering how this would actually play with the proposed uh, setback and transitions uh, in the compatibility chapter much further later, uh, further down. Um, and what happens if uh, we're all hit by the number two bus and our development services manager is replaced by Dr. Evil <laughs> and, um, you know, uh, and, and they start pushing this, you know, in ways that, that, that we don't expect. Um, so are there potential unintended consequences that, that would be negative by allowing this? So I will say in our existing code, we have provisions for modifications for infill redevelopment. And those are addressed in uh, currently in chapter 1501. And as part of the update, we wanted to incorporate those um, opportunities for modifications for infill redevelopment into the administrative modification section so that they, there were specific criteria uh, for those administrative modifications. Currently, existing code, uh, staff has the ability to modify standards on infill redevelopment and there currently is not a limitation in terms of that percentage of how much infill redevelopment we can consider um, as part under the, under the current code. Um, I guess obviously we want to be cognizant of, of infill redevelopment projects where the, and the applicability of particular standards um, whereby the scope and scale of a project can vary substantially. Um, and so uh, we want to have and continue to have that flexibility with respect to application of standards whereby it doesn't, so if it's at a certain point, it, maybe it's a percentage beyond that, that we don't want to have that necessarily to have to go through a variance process okay. if, it's a, if it's a reasonable standard. And so we felt that kind of maintaining that, that current uh, provision for staff to make determinate, determinations on a case-by-case -case basis for infill redevelopment. Um, I think we did note uh, specifically about uh, excluding building and structure height from that sure. provision because we didn't want to obviously run amok with respect to uh, additional building height in terms of infill right. redevelopment uh, modifications. And I think there's also uh, some language elsewhere in the code about uh, we can't make, or the, the director can't make uh, administrative changes that actually make things denser, um, basically make things worse. <laughs> um, so maybe that covers us as well. Um, you're right. I think in that section there's also some limitations in terms of modifications uh, to existing approved plans uh, in terms of increases in density or floor area and things of that nature. That's, okay. That is correct. Okay. Um, then, oh, Commissioner Flake, go ahead. Um, sorry, I hit the oh. wrong button actually, but in that same section, approval of use type that is not otherwise permitted is of some concern to me, um, not that the present occupant of the um, manager position would suddenly go rogue on us, but when would you actually look at something like that? Because um, there doesn't seem to be any kind of limitation on a use type not otherwise permitted. So is that the limitations on modifications? Yes. Of, of existing yeah, approved plans? Too little I. Or plats? Um, the modif if, uh, let's see as I'm reading this. I think that's the existing language that we have in our code, and I think the intent was obviously we're not, we're not allowing a use variance for something that's not already allowed or permitted in a particular either the plan or in that zoning district. So it doesn't allow staff to make a determination in terms of some type of use variance. Okay. 
Um, another question uh, in paragraph 5A uh, about a law that I have no idea what it is, uh, R-L-U-I-P-A. Um, but the language in this uh, paragraph, uh, if I'm reading it right, uh, says the director may grant administrative modifications to the user development standards stated in chapter 1504, and then you leave out some other parenthetical stuff, that creates a substantial burden on religious exercise. Um, are we saying that they may grant administrative modifications that create substantial burden? Because that would be weird. <laughs> or is it that we're creating, granting administrative modifications to use and development standards that create the burden? It is the latter. It's the latter? It is the latter, yes. Okay, I got wrapped up in this, so <laughs> is there a way to clarify it? Because I thought, oh my gosh, we are going to create burdens on religious groups. <laughs> the intent is to unburden if yes, there are right. standards that create a burden. Right, but I, I, I certainly mis, misread it. Uh, but I did go through it a couple times, and I ne until just now, I never saw the second way to read it. So anyway, just a note. Anything else on chapter 1502? Okay, chapter 1503. We're just zooming right along here. Um, if we go to page 79 of the document, no, sorry. Yes, page 79 of the document, page 92 of the PDF. Um, so we are now looking at 1503.020D, residential mixed neighborhood. And the nice new graphic that we have has no letter C in it, but there's a letter C in the, um, in the chart. Um, we, I think there's at least one other example of this. Um, and so just a heads up that we might want to clean those up because people will wonder if, if something was purposely left out. Yeah, I will say in that particular example, since there, this yeah, graphic is not a front-facing garage, that, that C dimension didn't apply to that particular graphic, but we could look at maybe adding some, okay. Ag some okay. additional graphics to have that example in. Right. Um, Commissioner Tetzloff. Yes, um, we heard from one um, citizen this evening about wanting to maintain his views from his house. Um, and looking through the standards, I just want to clarify, it looks like there are no residential districts that are higher than districts that currently exist and that if the districts were to maintain as they are, um, especially along Main Street there, um, stuff could actually build up to a height that it looks like we're changing it to already. So we're not making buildings any higher along Main Street from what it looks like in terms of what's, I mean, we've gone from kind of a feet to a stories, which could fudge it a little bit, but um, for the most part, we're not creating something that's 30 feet higher than what is currently allowed anyway. Well, I will say that as a base, four stories is, is what is proposed for along Main Street, but there are allowances uh, for additional height. Sorry, there are allowances for additional height for developments that incorporate affordable housing, or if they are near a transit facility, or if they are along a major corridor or intersection of major inter major corridors basically major centers. So potentially, yeah, there could be okay. some exceptions to those height standards. Um, I have another diagram that I have issue with. Um, it's uh, page 88 of the document. Uh, I think it's <laughs> 101 of the PDF. Again, there's no C on it. But if you rotate the, 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 uh, the image 180 degrees, you could actually show the back lot, probably. Uh, that's a good point. We've had, we actually had a staff discussion about this particular graphic and okay. whether or not it makes sense or it's, it's hard to interpret, so. 
Okay. We'll, we'll take a look at that. Oh, yeah. Time. Yeah, it is hard to interpret because of the, uh, the dash lines on top of the roof. Not really. Right. I, I was pondering that one as well. Not, not too sure there. Um, anything else on Chapter 1503? Okay, let's... Anything on Chapter 1504? Oh, oh, Commissioner Kohler. Can we actually go back to 1502? Sorry, I lost sure. track. Uh, page 28 in the PDF. In lap, Section H, Lapse of Approval. Um, we... Uh, Section 1 says the lap shall occur if they don't commence construction within one year of approval. Do we have a definition for that? Is, is construction just, you know, throwing some dirt around, or is there something that defines construction a little better? Um. Well, I'm gonna, I was just looking to see if we have a definition of construction. I looked quickly, but didn't, nothing jumped out at me. Okay. <clears throat> Typically, it's work associated with a building permit, footings and foundations, or piers associated with construction of a building. It, and is that pretty well defined in the building permit process? Uh, more defined than it is here, yes, and that's typically been our standard. We've also used that um, in all of our um, redevelopment agreements as kind of a standard just so that we can make sure there's a clear demarcation of commencement of construction, and that's what the chief building official feels is the best definition. Okay. Okay, so moving back to Chapter 1504, which is use regulations comments, discussion on that. Of course, we have the, uh, the new charts. I believe, right? <laughs> Commissioner Kohler. Um, table 4.1 under public and semi-public utility uses. I was wondering about the essential municipal and public utility uses, facilities, services, and structures, those all being permitted. I just kind of want to understand this a little better. So right now, if the city of Longmont wanted to put in a power line in any district, they could do that without any sort of approval, is that right? If it was considered to be an essential facility, yes. Okay, and then, so that's my, kind of my follow-up question. Um, I know the city has infrastructure it, within the city limits owned by Platte River Power Authority. If they needed to modify those facilities or build new ones, it doesn't look like there's any yeah. way for them to do that unless they're serving just the city. And from an electric grid perspective, I think that's pretty hard to do. You know, when they build those lines of that magnitude, they're not generally just serving one, you know, m municipality. Uh, so I think that might be the case where the, um, the planning director had to make that call since it's not uh, in the allowed uses. Is that right? You know, I think in the past when we have had PRPA projects, we have treated them as a permitted use under this section, irrespective of if it's just serving Longmont because we are a part of PRPA. So I don't think we've ever actually treated that differently than we would treat LPC. So it refers to municipal and public. So it potentially could be beyond our boundaries as well. Um, again, I'm looking for the definition under the use uh, section. So. Yeah, and I think the, the definition says something about, um, you know, needing to primarily serve, benefit the city or, or something to that effect. Um, okay. And then I guess along those same lines, uh, if a, another utility were to come in, say that it wasn't PRPA, say it was Excel Energy, how would they be permitted within the city if, you know, the city was just essentially being used as a path through to get, you know, from point A to point B? and they weren't serving the city. 
Uh, Chairman Chernick and Commissioner Kohler, so all of our um, other utilities like Excel basically go through our infrastructure permitting process, which is defined in another section of the municipal code, and they're issued a permit by our public works folks, so that's pretty standard and has been in place. So they don't actually come through planning to get a separate permit. They go straight to infrastructure permitting. Okay. And uh, that's not being changed then as part of this? No. Okay. More on 1504? Commissioner Flake? One of the use, one of the uses that I note is for a restaurant use in the RMN district. And yes, it is um, going to be with uh, its conditional use. But my question really is, um, one of the things that restaurants find they like to do is to be able to serve liquor. So how does that work in this kind of a neighborhood situation? Have we anticipated that because, you know, the unintended consequences? So how do we work with that? Is there a limitation somehow? I don't know, so what are your thoughts? Um, obviously, regardless of whether or not it's within the uh, restaurant, within the residential mixed neighborhood, multifamily, or within 250 feet of a residential lot in a district, um, if there's a liquor license associated with that under the draft standards, it requires a conditional use review, and so it would have to comply with compatibility standards associated with a conditional use. Um, obviously, it would have to go through uh, licensing through the local liquor licensing authority as well, and there's a hearing associated with that, so there'd be an opportunity for public comment um, associated with that. I know for liquor licensing, I'm not completely up to speed on that, but I know that there are some uh, separation, I believe there's some separation requirements from schools, not necessarily from residential areas, but. Um, so obviously it would, it would be addressed or discussed as part of that conditional use review process. Um, obviously there'd be a neighborhood meeting um, to get input from the neighborhood and feedback through that public hearing process. More on 1504 uses. Okay, well, we can always go backwards, um, but uh, let's move on to 1505, which is uh, the development standards. Um, and I'll start us off with, uh, oh, and by the way, Brian, um, I do have a list of uh, just typographic errors. I'll send it to you under separate Appreciate cover. Appreciate that. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's see, page 213 of, of the PDF, which is page 200 of the document, it's 1505.080. Um, we're looking at off-street parking spaces required. Um, uh, so it looks like it, in this particular chart, we, uh, we changed, or, or the, the center column is the current parking requirement, just for reference, and then the proposed parking requirement. So it looks as though on funeral facility and performing arts center or auditorium and reception and banquet hall, we're changing from seating capacity to occupancy capacity. Um, that makes sense to me on performing arts and receptions. Doesn't make sense to me with funeral facility because a dead person is an occupant. Um, <laughs> so uh, we might actually want to go back to seating capacity on the funeral facility. Okay. okay. Um, although it does, the occupancy idea does get back to uh, including employees, but um, so Still, it, it's just a caught my eye as a as a strange way to phrase it. Um, since yeah, anyway, it's a little bit morbid. Sorry. No, I'm fine. I mean, I'll certainly confer with our staff that kind of deal with parking standards as well and see okay. see if they concur with that. Okay, and then um, 
15, section 1505.200, which of course is our new section. And that is starting on page 262, which is, I hear all sorts of scrolling and clicking happening. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's page 249 of, of the document, page 262 of the PDF. Um, so this, of course, is, is what uh, a lot of the public comment has been about. Um, mm -hmm. And um, so I was, it, Brian, you already stepped us through this in your presentation, but how about if we just really revisit this? Um, could you walk us through this again? Um, so that we could actually really take a close look at it. Sure, sure. Sec you're, we're talking about s just subsection D, or are we talking about a um, broader, broader look at everything? I would say subsection D. We can start there? Start there, yeah. Okay. So um, as, as noted in the graphic, um, so from there's a, a height transition provision that's associated with the graphic. And uh, D talks about the first 75 feet that's closest to the residential district, uh, whereby that 75 feet would be limited to the, um, the revised, it's 35 feet, which is consistent with the adjacent uh, residential zoning districts, either the residential rural, the residential um, single family, um, or the residential mixed neighborhood. Um, and then past that first 75 feet, from 75 feet to 125 feet um, is where the building uh, could step up to 45 feet. And then uh, subsection D3 is beyond the 125 feet, then that building um, in the more intensive zoning district would be subject to the applicable height allowances within that particular uh, zoning district. Um, and then D4 talks about building features referenced as exceptions to maximum height requirements, and that refers back to chapter 1503 says that those shall be designed to minimize visibility to adjacent residential districts and fit within the allowed building height of the zoning district where the building is located to the maximum extent practicable. Obviously, um, that could be certain types of features, uh, whether that's a, um, you know, associated with an elevator or some other type of feature that can or cannot be, I mean, obviously located on, on the roof of a structure. Um, and then five talks about where you have a, a building uh, abutting a, um, a residential district that's a single family district, other less intensive residential district, that that setback, if so if it's immediately abutting, not separated by, let's say, a right away or an alley, then that building would be subject to the same setback as the adjacent residential district. Okay, so how did how did we get uh, the numbers uh, seventy five, one twenty five? Um, also, because I think I saw it in in your cover letter in the packet saying that that this was. This was a compromise uh, between, uh, like, the downtown authority, um, uh, historic east side neighborhood, um, and one other group, I forget which. Um, so I'm wondering, given the fact that we heard from the public uh, uh, and representatives from the historic east side, and they say they disagree with this, how do these numbers represent a compromise if they're now showing up tonight disagreeing? So uh, when we discussed this topic in January, um, it was a little bit different graphic. We'd, we had taken a graphic uh, just for illustration purposes from another community, but we had asked our code consultant uh, for a kind of a 
kind of a baseline uh, recommendation as a starting point for discussion with respect to uh, height transition based on work that they've done in other communities. And I will say um, that based on our discussions with our code consultant that um, they feel that their perspective is that these, these standards in the current draft are, um, are more restrictive than many of the other communities that they, they work with um, in terms of the height transition requirements. Um, and so we utilize the, the 75125 as a starting point for discussion with the commission in January, and we followed that up with discussion with city council in, in March. Um, subsequent, or uh, in addition to those discussions, uh, we had discussions with the Downtown Development Authority Board. Um, as noted in the communication, their recommendation was to either not have any height transition requirements or to have less restrictive uh, requirements. And then um, we also had an opportunity to meet with uh, another advisory group um, that was put together at the request of the Downtown Development Authority Board, which is called a Downtown Residential Advisory Group. Um, and so we met with them, I believe, in January. Um, dates escaping me, but anyway. Um, so we met with them and their representatives uh, from not only the residential neighborhoods either side of downtown, but also residents in the uh, downtown as well, the central business district. And so as part of that discussion, we discussed kind of the divergent viewpoints uh, from some of the residential neighborhood, the residential neighborhoods as well as the downtown development authority. And so, you know, they thought that what was in the draft was a kind of a reasonable middle ground or compromise to kind of the viewpoints of the historic east side neighborhood as well as the recommendation from the uh, downtown development authority board. Okay, so it, it sounds like we never had this downtown residential advisory group in the same room with historic east side or historic west side neighborhood groups. They, they never actually talked face to face with each other. There are there were representatives from historic east side and historic west side as part of that downtown oh, residential okay. advisory group. Okay, okay. Um, so how do we get to the 45 foot height? Um, where, where does that come from? Is that because is that the limit that's on Main Street? So that's the current height limit that's allowed, that would be allowed under our current code on, in that particular location. So for example, on the east side of Kimbark Street in the Central Business District, the height limit is 45 feet. Okay. And that applies to the entire lot currently. Okay. Commissioner Goldberg. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Aaron. Um, you'd think I'd be more prepared for the question. Uh, a member, two members of the public, but especially Mr. Palmer, um, suggested his concern about shading, or what he called shading, or maybe access to light. Can you offer Mr. Palmer any um, solace or any confidence in how the height of these neighboring, you know, of these future potential developments will or will not impact his access to height and, of course, the whole neighborhood along that side? Certainly. I, I don't have a, a specific diagram to address it, although we had some discussions with uh, local architects about the height transition and actually Sorry, thank you again. <laughs> um, actually, um, they, they volunteered to look at this and look at that worst case shadow effect um, during the winter months on December 21st and that angle, and I believe it's 21, roughly 21%. 
um, and that effect with those that's building setbacks and the 35 foot and the 45 foot height limitations and um, just not exact but um, based on some at least preliminary analysis it did not appear that that would that building step ups would cast a shadow under those scenarios but we'll, we're you know we're happy to kind of re revisit that and kind of redo the calculations if the commission would like us to, to take a look at that I'll turn to the <clears throat> my peers for some guidance on that um, my second question for you ties to um, Daria suggested that maybe she didn't feel fully informed about the revisions that were going on and, ha and its impact. Perhaps the historic east side had not been taken into consideration or had not been part of the updating, part of the, you know, been part of the opportunity to uh, offer their feedback along the way. Would you or Aaron just remind us of a few of the opportunities where you t engaged the community to get involved in? Did we miss the historic east side or were there opportunities throughout town where folks could get involved and get engaged and offer their feedback? Well, so in the communication, uh, there's a, a listing of the a variety of different organizations, uh, neighborhood groups, uh, uh, homeowners associations, information that was put out. And I, I kind of touched upon that as part of the presentation as well. Obviously, we knew that there, that there is, continues to be interest on part of the historic east side neighborhood as well as other neighborhoods in the community regarding the uh, update to the land development code and so one of our goals was to reach out to the neighborhood group early on in the process as well as the overall neighborhood group leaders association um, to apprise them and let them know of uh, potential changes that were in the works um, and so I, you know, we've had fairly regular on, uh, conversations with representatives from the historic East Side neighborhood as well as other neighborhoods. Um, as I mentioned, try to get the word out as best we can, either through city line, through the utility bills. There's been a number of articles in the Times call. Um, and so, we're, I mean, obviously we've been trying to do our best. And, you know, we were always uh, offered and welcome to participate or attend any uh, homeowners association groups or neighborhood groups to present information to their organizations as well um, so we you know we've certainly tried our best to um, reach out as much as we could to the to the community as part of this update process commissioner Kohler. I have a couple questions. My first one is, does anyone know what the height is on the Roosevelt apartments on Main? I'm just trying to get a visual. Yes, I do. It's, um, well, it depends on the actual part of the building, but it varies the, from 50 to 55 feet, the Roosevelt Park Apartments project, four stories. Okay. And then my next question, do you think you could summarize what the current plans are for this transition zone or this 35 feet or 45 and then the, and the 75 foot compared to what's currently allowed under the in the code so what's what's currently allowed um, is that we do not have a current transition or step up step back requirement um, we do have some landscape buffer requirements in our code currently but as mentioned for example in this particular area along Kimbark Street in the downtown which is currently zoned central business district the height that's allowed on that lot that's adjacent to the residential neighborhood to the east of the alley is 45 feet same would apply on the west side uh, on the west side of Terry Street on the kind of the west side of the central business district as well where that interfaces with the current r1 zoning district that height allowance is is 45 feet as well um, currently along main street uh, there's an allowance for 50 feet currently in terms of height in the central business district so this this change is, is just getting it's making it more restrictive yes 
So they could right now build something 45 feet right next to a residential neighborhood, no problems. That's correct as long as they complied with applicable buffering requirements, landscape buffer requirements. Okay, and now they'd have to be 35 feet and then scale up to 45 feet at the 75 foot distance. That, that is correct. Okay. Commissioner Goldberg. Well, you know, we are faced with these challenges every time we sit behind our this, this desk or this dais. Uh, and in the end, we always do our best, I think, to find the best option for, uh, for our town that we love. And um, I think that we do a great job of that. 13 meetings in um, with the help from every member of staff is just something that I'm really proud of. Um, you know, I think, Brian, what struck a chord today came from Rosemary when she called our historic district an endangered species. And um, I think that's very powerful, you know. Um, and what I heard from you was um, that compared to other municipalities, uh, the proposed uh, updates are conservative, are, you know, restrictive compared to maybe what you might find in other towns. Uh, and so that gives me comfort, uh, but I also at sometimes I don't want to compare ourselves to other towns. I just want to keep us being what we are, which is great. Um, so I just turn to the rest of the commissioners, and I think we all recognize the challenge before us, which is wanting you know our town to grow and to uh, continue to thrive and be unique, um, but also um, uh, protect the you know what is best about our town. So. Um, my rambling is just suggesting that it, this is a, a challenging decision for us to make, and um, I know that we're all weighing it heavily. And um, uh, you know, I think this is where it's going to come down uh, to our decisions. I'm going to chime in a little bit on this. Um, so, first off, Brian, if it is possible to get the assistance of, of the volunteer architects who have already helped you with uh, shade and shadow studies to do some pretty precise ones with, uh, you know, if, if anybody has like a, a 3D building uh, inventory of the actual buildings in downtown, um, sort of like what Boulder has in Google Earth, um, and could run shade and shadow studies off of that for us, it'd be awesome. Uh, because it'd be nice to see what what actually will happen, um, especially if if we hit the forty five foot uh, height limit. Um, the thing that that keeps bothering me is is actually the uh, the image uh, in the last page of Miss Fitzgerald's uh, packet, um, and this is this is something that that, that I think that it's this image. No. That one. Yeah. Uh, where, where she's talking about um, about mass and uh, and scale, um, in in relation to the pre-existing residential uh, neighborhood, this also goes back to uh, Miss uh, Rosemary Alley's comment about um, the flow uh, between. I, I was struck by that, not only endangered species, but. Uh, but that there's a flow uh, with between our residential area to the downtown, and and like we take it for granted because it's so seamless right now. Um, she got me to to realize, yeah, I I just assume it's going to be there. Well, that flow stops with something like that, and um, uh, and frankly. You know, we do see proposals come in front of us that, I mean, I would call that lazy architecture. Um, I mean, it's, it is just the cheapest way to build, to maximize the lot. Um, now, the graphic that's in our code proposal looks great because they've got really good examples of nice designs for a downtown. And we almost never see proposals like that. Um, so, so I think we, you know, I, I think uh, 
uh, looks like this drawing was done by Mr. McLaughlin. Um, I think his drawing helps us remember what is uh, likely to come in front of us. Um, and so my question would be, because it doesn't seem as though this part of the code addresses this yet, um, is could we go back to our consultants and find some way to codify not just by way of setbacks and in, in, in height, but to find some way to solve this massing and scale differential in a way that, that would actually show an even better transition from residential to downtown. Because we don't want what's in Mr. McLaughlin's drawing. That, that can't happen in Longmont, in my opinion. I'll, I'll move. <laughs> um, uh, Commissioner Flick. One of the things that um, I noticed on her drawing, or his drawing rather, here in I'm trying to do that. <laughs> but to gesture this, but one of the things that is not included in the drawing there is landscaping. And oddly enough, I, I know that we have heard speakers who say landscaping is no buffer really. Well, okay, yes and no. Landscaping softens edges quite a bit. And if you can have design guidelines for buildings, that's true, and require certain kinds of pediments and certain kinds of window treatments and they call it fenestration. Um, so you can have different kinds of aspects to buildings and we certainly want to encourage creativity rather than monoliths. But even when we talk about that historic east side, there are some large houses there. There are some very large houses there. And I recall one that we reviewed that without landscaping around is going to look enormous. But after the trees grow in and the shrubbery is there around the foundation, it's going to look like a number of those larger houses on that historic east side. That's not saying it resembles a commercial strip. It doesn't. But one of the things that we also don't have, we don't have those, we do not have all those little houses there either. We have a mix of houses, big, small, different architecture. It's fun. That's a good thing. We do want to protect our endangered, endangered species. But we also want to have a downtown. And we have step back things. The only other thing I could think of, I was looking through here as you were talking, looking at landscaping requirements, and we do have buffers, but perhaps we need to look at the most recent studies about landscaping and beneficial oxygen, and I, that may be too ecologically based, but one of the things we do know now is that trees are really, really good for us. So maybe our landscape buffers have to do less about the lower plant strata and more about planting trees in a variety of trees, small woods if you like, as buffers because when they get a certain height, you can't see the buildings. I know that takes a while, but there has to be some compromise here. You try to get as best you can of both worlds, but I think our, our skill has to look at what kind of landscaping buffer gets brought to us. And that's one of the things we, as a commission, can look at and say, what are you doing that in 5, 10, 15, 20 years for the life of your building with how you're going to build it nicely and well is going to work out with the adjacent things that are already there? Um, I don't like to see monoliths and I've seen a lot of them put up. The other thing I wanted to say something about, there is a senior housing project. I think it's 12 stories. And it's about a block off where the senior center is in Roosevelt Park. It's to the south of it. 
it's a wonderful place to go and see the fireworks because there's nothing obstructing the view except weather. And that thing sits right across the street from single family dwellings that are only single story. And yet nobody's died because the building is huge and monolithical looking, but there is landscaping. Now, if there was no landscaping, it would look pretty bad. So drive by it, take a look, see what you think. Commissioner Tesla. Looking at both of these drawings, um, if potentially we're having somebody maybe take a look at this again, um, maybe, maybe instead of having drawings such as either of these, um, we could get more of a perspective as to what you'd see if you're actually on the street. Um, this drawing that's currently in the code, um, I don't know if you could see that in any community anywhere unless you're out on the plains and there's not a tree planted because you'd inevitably you would have some landscaping somewhere that would kind of break that up. Um, and the drawing in the packet we got, um, I think the houses appear shorter than they actually are just because they're kind of placed in front. Plus we seem to be coming kind of at an angle. Someone's jumping really high on a trampoline to see this. Um, and I think it may help ease people if they can see perspectives of what this might actually look like if they're standing on the street a view that might actually make sense because at some point we do have to kind of come to a compromise between um, letting that 45 feet be right up on the property line um, and or making them go all the way back if you got a really deep property that could be a couple hundred feet that you suddenly are basically losing height on your property because of where you're located so just a thought on maybe we could potentially find a drawing that's more perspective based I'm going to chime in on Commissioner Tetzloff's uh, uh, comment. What we, excellent point, by the way. Um, what's in, the, uh, in our packet currently is an elevation. Elevations are abstract uh, by definition. Uh, nobody ever sees anything like that. You can never perceive those buildings that way. That's, I mean, elevations are, are not real, uh, reality. Perspectives can sway us. Um, you're right, Mr. McLaughlin's drawing is a bird's eye view, um, and therefore it skews uh, our perception of, of how tall the, uh, uh, the houses are. What we would need would be per perspectives with an eye height of five foot six. That's what we need, okay? Um, that's generally considered the, the standard uh, for, for a perspective that meets the eye height of the average person. So uh, that will put things uh, into proper perspective. Uh, uh, Commissioner Flagg, yes, point well made. You know, there's, there, there's certainly, uh, you know, landscape can do a lot. Um, but um, the kind of project that Mr. McLaughlin has shown uh, is the kind of thing where, where they come along and say, oh, we'll just shrub it up. Um, and uh, so, yes, perhaps asking for even greater landscape standards uh, in, that, in that district could go a long way. What about, I was reading recently that, that Denver has something like, I think it's 10 uh, view sheds, uh, view planes. Um, so apparently from, from uh, Coors Field, um, they basically, kind of like our airport, you know, with, with the mathematical definition of the plane, you know, the geometric plane uh, through space. But they define a geometric plane from a uh, home plate, a Coors Field, and no building can, can be built higher than that. So the further away, the higher the building, because mm -hmm. it's not going to break that, 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 that angle. Would something like that help us? Or are we talking too small of distances for that even to be feasible? I mean, it might push, you know, buildings over onto Terry Street, and Terry Street gets all the tall buildings. Um, so, com uh, Commissioner Goldberg. Uh, I applaud uh, Chairman Chernak uh, for revisiting the shade study, and Commissioner Tetzloff uh, for 
uh, looking, considering a more real uh, perspective. Uh, and we could definitely get a, you know, that study from five foot six inches tall, which thankfully I'm just above that. Um, I just wonder if we're taking this too far for a code. I wonder if the burden has been met. I wonder if we get a new shade study. Brian's team created a shade study. It was pretty accurate. Maybe it could be more accurate, maybe not. Maybe the results would change, maybe not. But he asked for one to be done, and it was done, and I suspect it was mostly right. And there was little to no impact on the neighborhood. Um, what is before us is a, is a code that represents uh, thought and intention behind it that is more restrictive than maybe the norm, uh, and yet uh, it protects our endangered species, uh, but also allows that balance that uh, Commissioner Flake has mentioned. And so I just wonder if the burden has been met and um, if this is the best option to move forward with. Commissioner Flake. I have actually worked with and put together view planes for Denver. And in my experience, what you do is you define a view you wish to protect. And you work from there. And you work from there with the view that you want to protect from a point that you identify from which you will then make your surveying men members, uh, measurements. We have not identified any such thing in the city of Longmont. So I can't even imagine how such a thing would apply. Well, that's my point, is that we would need to come up with view planes. Um, and given the fact that, that we're making a recommendation to city council and that, and that we can uh, uh, suggest uh, that they still continue to uh, review this carefully, that's why I'm um, willing to kind of keep pushing on, on some more study, more, more, more ideas. Um, the, um, it also struck me with the public commentary that, yeah, this is a, a, a tipping point, and I, I, I sense that as well, because, I mean, our, our code's going to not get this kind of update again for probably another 10 years or so, right? Um, At least until I retire, so. <laughs> okay, all right. Oh, you're not going to go through this again. Okay, all right. <laughs> so, um, so, I don't think we can make it perfect. I don't think there's any such thing. But, um, you know, if, if city council sees us grappling with this, um, and if our council representative can go back to city council and say, yeah, the commission really, you know, doesn't think this is uh, really exactly landing where, where we want it to be, then we can leave it to city council to, uh, to push it over the goal line. Commissioner Goldberg, <laughs> sorry. Um, as a commissioner for five or six years, I hate letting the council make the final decision, you know, and it uh, rubs me raw when they make a decision against what we recommend. And so I don't, I hope I'm not projecting any interest in passing the buck. Um, and I hope there's no suggestion uh, that we haven't grappled with this and members of council and our liaison have not observed that. Um, I think um, all of us, I, I suspect Aaron, uh, council member Rodriguez and formerly Commissioner Rodriguez uh, has been able to pass on the word to his peers as to the level of grappling that we've done. Uh, so I didn't mean to be dismissive and, and, and nothing is further from my interest than to um, disregard the uh, preference and the interest of the public. I think every meeting we summarize uh, and make interest and efforts to hit on every comment offered by the public. So I just think that I wonder if we have done, if we have exhausted all options and we, what we have before us is a, is a fine piece of work to push forward. I might not be right. Commissioner Teta. I mean, I, I can't help but 
agree with uh, Mrs. Fitzgerald that the tallest buildings ought to be located on Main. And um, I feel like the 75-foot transitional area seems appropriate. Um, I wonder if we were to increase that to appease some people, how, how much bigger would we make it? And how would that, how would that play with, uh, you know, if we were talking about houses on, say, the west side, east and west sides of Kimbark, or, or businesses on the west and houses on the east. Um, feels to me like ten, a 10 foot difference or a differential between them within that 75 feet doesn't sound all that dramatic. Now, I realize if a house is only 25 feet, even if it could be 35 feet, then we're talking about a 20-foot differential. But um, would, would changing any of these things impact um, residential homeowners in terms of what they would be allowed to then do with the height of their buildings? I'm going to suggest we take a... Uh a break until 9.10. Um, it's getting kind of hot in here, too. <laughs> so um, we'll cool down, and we'll come back at 9.10. Okay, we will return from our break uh, back to our discussion. Um, so, let's see. I think we have given Brian and Aaron a lot to uh, carry forward on uh, paragraph D of 1505-200. Um, is there anything else we want to, that anybody would like to uh, refer to or, or go over in chapter 1505? because we have five more chapters to go over. Anything? No? Okay. Let's move on to chapter 1506. Um. <laughs> yes, uh, so this is uh, the signs chapter. Um, and I have something on page... Uh, 255 of the document, um, which is uh, page 268 of the PDF. Um, so it's uh, section 1506.020, paragraph B, uh, paragraph 3. Brian, there's an and at the end of that sentence. Is there something missing there? Or is that just a typo? I mean, is there? No, that's just a typo. Okay, all right. <laughs> Wasn't sure. Um, <laughs> and then if we move on to page 278, uh, oh, it's, a, uh, it's another diagram thing. Um, it's page 265 of the document, um, 278 of the PDF. Um, so it's 1506050D. Four, individual sign lettering may be placed on top of a first-story canopy attached to a building entrance. And we seem to be indicating paragraph four, but with a number two in the diagram. So uh, that would be changed. Yep. Um, page 288 of the PDF, which is page 275 of the document. It's 1506.110. Um, OK. So Brian. I apologize. I'm still lost. On, I, I, which page are we on? I'm now? sorry, uh, page 275 of the document, which is page 288 of the PDF. So it's 1506.110. Downtown design standards? Yes, okay, exactly. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so paragraph A, uh, the downtown sign des uh, design standards are hereby adopted. 
So you said in your in your opening remarks that we adopted those in 2014 and that the commission uh, recommended adoption of those. And of course, this weekend when I read through them, I, I, I wrote here in my notes, ugh. Um, there's, <laughs> um, I found all sorts of things that I had, that I had issue with, um, but um, it's mostly that that there's a lot of gray areas within that design standard. Um, not to mention a lot of uh, mistakes. There's even an, an image that shows an example of a banner sign that breaks their own code. Um, the image contradicts the written code. Um, now, you know, maybe maybe I've gotten better at, at, at my task since 2014, um, or, or maybe I just saw it in a different light. But um, but the so those downtown design standards. Those, I mean, we're not approving those tonight. We're we're, we're just referencing them. They're already basically on the books, right? <clears throat> they are on the books. We've looked through them and made some changes to address kind of that content-based, or remove content-based uh, standards. Okay. Um, we've also done a little bit of reformatting and such, but I, you know, you're right. That, that particular image about the temporary signs, about the banners or the inflatables, yeah, we should probably swap that out. Well, actually, uh, this is in the downtown design standard document. Yes, that's there, correct. Yeah, there's there's actually two, I believe, two images in there that that, that like contradict their own uh, their own code. Um, but um, but that code is the DDA's code, right? It's not ours, or is it the city? So when that was adopted in 2014, um, and the section that references that in Chapter 1506. Uh, when council adopted those standards, it granted the DDA board as a downtown design board some authority to review and approve signs, particularly the aesthetics of signs in the downtown. Okay. And so that's why it's currently uh, in an appendices of the land development code. Okay. So it doesn't it doesn't necessarily address like the location, size, area, um, places of signs that are dictated in our sign code chapter, okay. 1506, but it goes further in terms of design aesthetic for the downtown. So since it's an appendix, it could be changed separate from this, go this whole code revision going through, uh, you know, from through us and then through city council. So we, so like maybe I could work with you offline and and just kind of go through my concerns on it, uh, and we could uh, resolve it some other way. Um, well, since it's part of the code, Kay. we were hoping, and it's referenced in chapter fifteen oh six. We are hoping to adopt it with this update. It's not to say that we couldn't make future amendments okay. All right. uh, along with the other batch of amendments that I referenced earlier in my presentation. Shall we dig into it then? Sure. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, so I'm switching to the uh, downtown Longmont sign design standards document, which was included in our packet. Um, um, now, there's a whole slew of typos, which I'll send you, okay. But there's one on the very front page. The downtown Longmont is the active heart of our community. Mm. Doesn't start off well. Um, Let's go to well, let's start with page thirteen of it. Okay, so we're we're looking at wall signs. Um 
And the downtown design review criteria for wall signs, uh, paragraph six, says signs painted directly on the building are not allowed, um, except when recreating historic signs. Um, so that contradicts the section later in the, in the design code about murals. Murals are painted directly on the building. They're allowed. So we have a problem there. Um, uh, on the next page, under awning and canopy signs, paragraph 7, individual sign lettering may be placed on top of a first story canopy attached to a building entrance provided the letters do not interfere with key architectural elements. Really don't know what that means. Individual sign lettering, do, do you mean like, does it mean that letters are being affixed flat onto the canopy, Up, upright? I don't understand that, that paragraph, personally. Um, let's see, uh, page 15. Um, the left-hand image of a mounted perpendicular permanent banner sign. Um, if you look at paragraph five, for banners installed more than eight feet above the sidewalk, the brackets shall be provided at both top and bottom of the banner. Clearly that banner is higher than eight feet because the woman standing there is probably about five foot five. So there's no bottom bracket. So that picture has to get replaced because it, uh, it actually breaks the code. Um, we go to page 16 on window signs. Um, okay. Um, paragraph five of the d of the review criteria for temporary handwritten paper, cardboard, and plastic signs aren't allowed. Makeshift sign message applications on windows with paint or other mediums are prohibited. Um, in their glossary, in the, in the definitions, makeshift is not defined. I don't know what makeshift means. I don't think make, makeshift is a word that's enforceable. Um, what does that really mean? Um, the, uh, then paragraph eight, artistically and professionally hand-painted signs will be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, they uh, are basically saying that uh, in this section that um, that the if you look at the rightmost photograph, no hand painted signage or signs that cover more than twenty five percent of the window uh, are allowed, and of course they're showing a certain type of, of sign painting. Um, now you look at the left hand pa uh, the left hand photograph that could actually be a hand painted sign. Okay. So um, there are sign painters who, who do extremely precise signs mm -hmm. as compared to the tempera paint uh, hand-painted sign on, on the outside surface of, uh, of the window. But I know a professional sign painter who specializes in that tempera paint type of signage. Um, and so does this code mean, because she's a professional, um, if it is less than 25%, are they going to disallow her style of sign painting simply because it's that sort, it's pictured there as a tempera sign paint? Is that makeshift? Um, it's getting a little, to me, it's um, a little problematic in the fact that, that they are indicating with their images the type of signage that they don't want, the, the tempera paint but the language is not precise enough to actually make that clear. Like, why, why is that photo on the right, other than the 25% of the coverage of the window, but why, why else have they chosen that particular style? Because that particular style is actually a professional style that, that some painters uh, engage in. Also, to say that uh, hand-painted signs um, are, I, I mean, the overall uh, uh, gist of this is that they don't want hand-painted. They don't want makeshift. Um, 
and that they're only case by case. But they want to preserve historic signs. They were all hand painted. <laughs> so why that? Why don't we just sandblast them off? They're, they're makeshift. Get rid of them. Um, then on page 17, uh, temporary paragraph 4, temporary handwritten signs are prohibited. Again, makeshift sign message applications on windows with paint or other mediums are prohibited. Um, uh, again, need to define makeshift. Um, then if we go to page 22 on portable A-frame signs, um, now, in 1506, uh, and actually in, I think it's in the definitions, um, we define in, in that part of the code uh, what the area of, of a double-sided sign is, that the, the, the square footage allowed for a double-sided sign, like a blade sign, um, is so many square feet and basically you're counting just the square footage of one side, but that's because the faces of that sign are parallel. Um, they're saying that the maximum frame size for a rectangular A-frame sign is four feet in height and two feet in width. So that's eight square feet total with up to six square feet of sign area, but they don't mention if that's per side. If that's not per side, then you really get a teeny tiny area because those are not parallel faces on an A-frame sign. Um, so that has to get clarified. Um, and then their photograph of the sandwich board with fruit and veg. Oh no, it's a hand-painted sign. Should that be allowed? What's going on there? Why is that okay? Is it because it's pretty? Fr fruit and vegetables? I don't know. Um, Okay, and the rest are typos. So those were my concerns with that. And as, as noted before, Commissioner Chernak, if, if you have a list of typos or other edits, I'll certainly them. appreciate sharing yeah. those with us. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Anything else on 1506? It was the middle of the afternoon, my second pot of coffee. <laughs> maybe, maybe I was getting cranky. I don't uh, know. We, we appreciate um, your input. Sir. Okay. Um, okay. Anything on 1507, which is subdivision and improvement standards? Anybody? Uh, Commissioner Tetzloff. This is actually going back to the downtown sign design standard um, in defense of the handwritten note. Um, I believe, as I would interpret this anyway, with the handwritten sign being underneath the window signs, that the handwriting only applies to the window signs. And so because it does not say no handwritten signs under the A-frames, you would be allowed to do that. But maybe I'm interpreting it incorrectly. I think you're correct. Okay, um, anything on 1507? Commissioner Flake. I'm looking at uh, page 294 of the PDF, and I just, you know, we don't want to keep rewriting things, and so I wondered why you would be quite so specific about fee structure. And. About about the, uh, the cash in lieu you fees? Know, the cash in lieu things and to develop land value because th this can change. And I know you have to have it somewhere where people can look at, but why would you put such a specific kind of a statement there in a code that you hope you don't have to change for a while? I think that's specifically related to our intergovernmental agreement with the school district and since it affects development, it has to be incorporated into the code and that's why we have these fee tables in the code. So my question again then is why wouldn't you have it be referred to in an appendix? An appendix can easily be taken out and put in as fee structure or whatever changes 
Just a thought. Uh, even, even if it were an appendix of the code, it would still need to be adopted and changed by ordinance. So regardless of where it is. And Brian, correct me yeah. if I'm wrong, but I think at one of our previous meetings we talked about this, and and this is rarely changed. And Th that's correct. I I don't believe that this fee structure has changed probably in the last five or ten years. Two thousand six, Aaron says maybe. Okay. So it doesn't change frequently. Okay. Anything else on Chapter fifteen oh seven? Okay. Chapter 1508, nonconformities. I know we had a, a discussion about that at one of our more recent meetings. Any discussion tonight? And I know the commission did at our previous discussion, I think it was in February, mm -hmm. there were some questions about uh, unavoidable circumstances allowing or granting additional time frame, and so we try to incorporate some additional language in that to address that to comment. Okay, seeing nobody jumping up and down like I was about signs. <laughs> uh, chapter 1509, Enforcement and Penalties. Anything there? I think a lot of this was not changed. I remember right. Well, 1509, we've done some revisions to that to uh, kind of better enable staff to enforce the provisions of the code. So. Okay. 1510, 15010. Um, yeah, in terms of the numbering, we need to change that to 1510. Okay. Just, <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's just weird. <laughs> okay. All right. But any issues about any of the definitions? I I will say I did like the fact that that the first section of it was divided by concept. That was helpful. Um like, you know, definitions for industrial uses, definitions for, uh, um, you know, vehicles, uh, you know, whatever. So um, rather than just one huge massive list that was just alpha. So that, that, that's much more user friendly. Okay, so I think that takes us through all the chapters. Um, Anybody want to revisit anything or dig into anything else? Commissioner Flagg. Can we look at the map briefly? Let me pull it up as well. What I'm primarily looking at is the area <coughs> along Lashley, you know, my favorite place. Um, it would be along Lashley to the west of Lashley between um, 9th Avenue and north of there up to 17th Avenue. And one of the things that caught my eye a little bit, just because I know the area a little bit, is that um, to the west of Centennial Park there, are the trend homes primarily of which, in fact, I can't think of any duplexes in there, but I could be mistaken, but for the most part, that area bounded by the railroad track, 9th Avenue, Lashley and Mountain View is single family structures. So it seems odd and they're not attached to one another. And then north of there, you have an area between 15th and the railroad track and 17th and Lashley, which I know to have a real good mix of duplexes and single family. And then the, and that's going to be zone R1. So that was a little confusing to me. Okay. The last one, I'll 
do it in clockwise. I didn't counterclockwise. From 17th to Lashley to 15th to the railroad track there. And that area actually is a real good mix of duplexes and single family, whereas the trend homes that I mentioned first are not a mix. They're just seemingly single family dwellings. I might be missing something, but I didn't think I was on that area. So it seems a little confusing that the area where there aren't duplexes would have um, the more increased density in the mixed use part, whereas the area with the duplexes and single family mixed kind of interestingly through there um, would tend to be the less dense area. It just, I thought, kind of was interesting. So my thought is take another look at how it's coded. Um, and there were some other areas that I know we don't want to get little choppy blocks of zoning, so I tried not to look at smaller areas that do have really single family dwellings uh, east of Midtown there, um, there's that large, more industrialized area there along um, just to the east there of Collier. But along Collier and Corey and that area, there are small homes with their single family, but they have really narrow local streets. And should you have an opportunity to put a business in there, I don't know how the delivery trucks would get around. I'm, it's just from a practical standpoint, it doesn't seem like it would work. Anything else? We have PZRs. So if there's a motion. Commissioner Goldberg. Before we make any motions, I did want to address um, or see if we could address Mr. Palmer's concern about commercial vehicles parking in the historic east side part um, neighborhood. Brian, it was almost suggested like that we were going to take action or that there was some sort of promise or expectation that we would be limiting parking of commercial vehicles in this neighborhood. Would you, can you speak to that at all? Is that something that we agreed to? Is that something that we can do? How can we regulate who parks in that part of town? Um, well, I haven't looked into the history of Comcast and Xfinity, um, that particular approvals and what limitations or promises may have been made with respect to parking of vehicles. Um, I don't believe that we have particular restrictions with respect to parking on public streets of which vehicles can park where. Um, I know there's some limitations regarding RVs now, but um, but we can I mean we can certainly look at kind of the history of that that Comcast facility. Um, I haven't, like I said, I haven't looked into that. Um, I know there's been some discussions by the DDA board about parking in the downtown and ongoing conversations about parking demand. Um, parking facilities, whether or not there should be some type of parking permit system, whether there should be a cash and lieu fee for parking, and I think that's something that the board um, is going to consider, con continue to consider and discuss uh, in the near term. Um, it was addressed or mentioned as part of their downtown master plan. Um, and so that's something that I know Kimberly McKee, who is the executive director, We'd like to have a conversation with our city staff, transportation staff, about parking in the downtown as well. I don't know if I've completely answered or <laughs> not your question, but I mean, like I said, in terms of parking on, on public streets without a public permit 
a parking permit program in place. We don't really have restrictions of which vehicles can park on which public streets. Thank you. I think that was the question, the answer I was looking for. Histo we're not, historically, we have not regulated who parks on public streets. That's correct. More discussion on this? Commissioner Flagg? Actually, I think there has been, I thought there was something that doesn't allow for commercial vehicles to be parked on a residential street. So I'm not sure if that would apply for that neighborhood area, residential dwellings, um, because I have noticed driving by there, there's a fair few Comcast vehicles well into a neighborhood area. I don't know if that would matter. If it's in a different part of the municipal code, it's, I know it's not in the land development code as far as I know, but we'd have to check with other staff and there's other restrictions in other parts of the municipal code. Commissioner Goldberg. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I guess this is a procedural question. Um, if there were to be a motion to uh, approve PZR 2018-4A, um, is it understood that is with given the feedback um, offered by the commission, or do we need to point to specific comments that have been made that need to be included? I'm fine with moving forward with the direction provided by the commission this evening as part of the conversation. Uh, Dan, do you, is that reasonable? Or do you need more specific direction from the commission as part of a resolution adoption? Chair Chernick, it's Commissioner Goldberg. It, it's not, thank you, Joni. <laughs> it's not necessary to uh, point to specific concerns or provisions at this time. I know that historically the commission has liked doing that. My guess is that planning staff didn't include a PZR with conditions because that list could be very long. And that makes sense to me. And it's not necessary, since it's not necessary to point that out and staff's going to bring that to the council anyway, I think that moving forward with A, would serve your purposes. Okay, then. Um, I'll throw it out there and see if it sticks. Uh, given our discussion, uh, given the feedback from the chairman and the rest of the commission and the um, discussion back and forth with members of staff, uh, I'll go ahead and propose that we approve PZR 2018 or recommend approval of 2018-4A, um, taking into consideration the feedback from the commission. I'll stop. Commissioner Flake. I second that motion. Okay, so uh, motion to approve PZR 2018-4A, seconded uh, by Commissioner, motion by Commissioner Goldberg, seconded by Commissioner Flake. Um, any further discussion? Let's take a vote on the motion in front of us. Okay, that has passed unanimously, uh, six to zero. Um, and this item will now be forwarded to the Longmont City Council for action. If you're unfamiliar with council procedures and intend to appear before council, please contact the Planning Division for further information at 303-651-8330. I would like to extend a huge thank you to Brian and to Aaron. Uh, you've really done an amazing job walking us through bit by bit, step by step, um, code section by code section. So thank you for your patience with all of our questions and, and my typo lists, et cetera. Thank you to the commission. We certainly appreciate your indulgence over the 13 meetings. <laughs> and also thank you to the, to the public, uh, some of whom are still here with us. Um, uh, all of your input is very valuable to us. Really appreciate uh, you coming out for an evening of uh, discussion about uh, planning code. Um, let me get back to our agenda.
Okay. Uh, Next is a, our final call for the public invited to be heard. If any members of the public who are here would like to come forward and speak again um, about anything that was not on tonight's agenda, uh, we'd be happy to hear from you again. Uh, you get five minutes. Ms. Fitzgerald. Um, Mr. Schernick and commissioners, um, I just wanted to clarify one thing. There was a comment made in the earlier public invited to be heard about lack of notice and lack of opportunity. Um, so one person felt that they hadn't been noticed. I feel like we've had more than adequate notice. We've had lots of opportunities. Staff has been very, um, given us a huge amount of opportunity to interact and, and provide our comments. So I just wanted to clarify that I think, you know, you can never get that out for everybody. But I feel very satisfied with the public process that's taken place. Um, and hopefully that will continue in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fitzgerald. Anybody else who would like to come forward? Alex Samori, 428 Pratt Street. I'm here as a representative of DDA, as the chair of DDA. First, I want to thank you for your considered deliberation of the discussions tonight. I also wanted to remind you that, as commissioners, you approved 100 fully the master plan for the Downtown Development Authority of uh, 2017, and so did Council. And that plan, it specifically addressed increasing the density of population in downtown so that there would be a thriving community without impacting the look or feel of downtown. And what was presented tonight, I think, was a good compromise, especially in, in the testimony that what was presented is more conservative than other communities allow. And one also wanted to remind you that you approved a project at 4th and Terry, that was the Brownstones, that abutted directly against neighboring homes. There's no alley, there's no setback. And some of the units are 25 feet or higher. And a couple of them look directly into my backyard. And we've had no issues whatsoever. If you also look at the Dickens building in downtown, I think it's 40 feet at least or more, as well as the uh, Odd Fellows building. So if you wanted a perspective of a five, six foot and what it would look like, there's plenty of samples in downtown without having to incur additional costs and do additional drawings. And I would hope uh, that in the next round of discussions that you would consider approving it as it was presented. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Samari. Anybody else? I believe two other people. Um, no? Okay, uh, we'll close the um, public invited to be heard. Uh, any items from the commission? Commissioner Goldberg. Thanks, Chairman. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to offer one last um, token of appreciation to the members of the public. Um, today we had Kate, uh, Ms. Diver, Doria, Laverne, Mike Palmer, Paula Fitzgerald, and Bill and Rosemary Alley. But actually over the course of the last 13 meetings or, or several meetings we've had, a few members, Paulo included, Sharon O'Leary and a couple others that have represented the historic east side, I think professionally and with composure and um, strategically, and I think made a, a real impact. Uh, and I just wanna appreciate uh, that neighborhood who's uh, a big part of the story uh, for their um, practicing democracy and being a part of, of the Longmont story. So thank you and um, appreciate it. Okay, items from Council Representative Rodriguez. Thank you, Chair Schernick. Uh, I just wanna say thank you guys for your thoughtful consideration of a, a very lengthy document. Uh, I will be sure to convey to my fellow council members the discussions had here tonight, and thank you for your service. Thank you, items from Pl uh, Director of Planning and Development Services, Jenny Marsh. Nope, nothing. Unless anybody's opposed, we will be adjourned. Thank you.